Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Thomas Lindsay. He's the Executive Director and an attorney for the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which has assisted close to 200 communities across the country in eight states to adopt binding local laws that elevate community rights to sustainability over corporate rights and powers. For, so first, as always, thank you for your decades of great work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Yeah, thanks for having us back, Derek. So, um, something you've been working on for a decade now has to do with rights of nature, and can you talk about that, what that means? Can you talk about some of the, why that's important, and can you talk about some of the history, and then can you lead us to what has happened most recently around that uh, having to do with Lake Erie? Sure. So when we talk about community rights, because we talk a lot about this community rights movement that's emerging across the United States, that we're talking more uh, than just about the homo sapiens or the people that live in a community having certain rights over what happens in that community. And namely, our work has arisen because people have opposed large corporate projects like toxic waste incinerators or landfills or fracking wells or large scale hog factory farms coming into their communities that we've been working for 20 years to establish basically a community right to veto those projects. So even if those projects are licensed and permitted by the state or federal government, that we believe that the locality, the people within that locality have a right to decide whether that project operates or not within their particular community. And so during the work that we've been doing over the last 20 years, it's been primarily about that. How do we establish a legal theory and an organizing theory around communities having a right to say no to those projects, which are going to be harmful to them? And along the way, uh, about 10 years after that work began, uh, communities started coming to us with questions about the status of nature and the natural environment and ecosystems. Basically asking us, well, you know, humans having rights to certain things in the community makes a lot of sense. And collectively, the community having a right to say no to these projects makes a lot of sense. But nature itself really has no rights under the law. And nature is treated as property, which basically means that if you own a 10 acre piece of property, you have a deed to it, that it carries with it the right to destroy the ecosystems on that piece of property. The lawyers talk about it as a bundle of rights when you have a deed to a piece of property that you have a bundle of rights which come with that ownership. And one of the one of those rights within the bundle of rights is the right to destroy the property that you own. And so nature under our system of law is is basically treated as property. Uh, that uh, private ownership of that property or uh, even governmental ownership of that property all carries with it the right of the owner to destroy that piece of property. And because of that, folks in our communities who said, well, it's great that humans have a right to say no to this, that projects would come in and infringe on our rights as humans uh, within the community, but nature and streams and rivers and forests and ecosystems don't have rights. So that would be like I could complain because they're going to put in a hog farm. I could complain because it stinks as opposed to – complaining because it's going to destroy a nearby river. Right. And we have a right to complain now, but usually that right to complain doesn't get us anywhere because the laws that set up in the United States doesn't recognize our cities, towns, villages, and counties as having a right to say no after the state and federal government has said yes to the project. Oh, so, so we have the right to complain, just not to stop it. Yeah, we always have the right to complain. We just don't have the power to nullify or veto that particular project coming in, even if it's going to cause us harm. So it's an unfortunate piece of the law, but it's it's been the law for the past 150 years in the United States that if the state or federal government has issued a permit to a corporation or a business entity to do a certain activity in a community, even if it's going to be harmful to the community, that the community itself does not have the authority to say no to it. So you can't you can't take a referendum vote and say, we don't want that. We're going to reject it. Uh, it. They don't have the power to do that as a municipality versus the state and federal approval of it. Well, 
Well, because there is a history, unbelievably, in some ways, of local community self-government that existed in the very earliest days of the Republic, that there actually was a recognition in the 1800s of a right of local community self-government that couldn't be taken away by the state or federal government. That, in other words, people within communities had a constitutional right to govern their own community. And just because the state or federal government decided to take an action didn't mean that that overrode the local community from saying no to these things. So it's like we have this residue that was uh, taken from us over the last 150 years in some ways. And I think it was really the spirit of the American Revolution. It was this concept that self-governance was very important, not only if, if it was at the state or federal level, but also at the community level. You have early state constitutions which use the word community. So like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and Virginia, some of the earliest state constitutions that other states modeled their own constitutions after used the word community self-government. And so when we go into court, uh, even though the current conventional status of law is that communities don't have the rights to say no to a frack well coming in or whatever, that we argue that historically they did. And we're trying to resuscitate that kind of law uh, that was in the courts and in these early state constitutions. And, of course, municipalities were around long before states were. So a lot of the early colonies were municipalities. They were sub-state units. And so in some ways, our cities, towns, villages, and counties were around long before the state or federal government. Yet today, the status of the laws of the state or federal government can mow them under uh, with ease. Uh, and at whim whenever they choose to do so. But the, the status of the current law in the United States is that, uh, let's say you're living in a city and a uh, big project has been proposed for the city. The big project, the corporation that's proposing it goes to the state and gets a state permit or to the federal government gets a federal permit to put something in, that if the city attempts to pass a law that bans that project, that it is acting illegally and unconstitutionally under the law, that the community itself doesn't have that power under our system of law. And you can ask the environmental lawyers and the corporate lawyers, everybody agrees this is the status of the law today. And so when we started, you know, we started as an environmental law firm appealing permits and trying to argue that the state or federal government had issued permits to corporations uh, unlawfully, that they had not followed and complied with their own regulations. But our work shifted to actually assisting communities to be able to say no to these projects because it became very clear to us that the system of law, the thumb was on the state and federal side of things and not on the local. And so today, in a nutshell, when we argue to courts about whether a community has the power to say no to something like you know, this small community in Pennsylvania that has stood up for six years now saying no to a frack wastewater injection well. The reason why you don't have the authority to do that is because the corporations have rights to sue your community to override what you want to say in terms of banning or prohibiting that particular project. And it's very complicated. Uh, it's, it took us 10 years just to figure out the basic, you know, rules about how this thing works. And most communities have no clue that they're operating under the system of law because they come to us and say, well, we don't want that thing here and it's going to hurt us and we want to say no to it, to which we have to say, well, we're sorry, the law doesn't allow you to say no, but, you know, we can move in this new direction to try to resuscitate that historical memory of community self-governance uh, and help them move in a certain direction. And so as we were doing that work, you know, we had about, to, you know, 200 organizational community clients like the city of Pittsburgh and the county of Mora in New Mexico and different folks that want to engineer a new system of law to recognize community rights to say no to these projects that people started coming to us and saying, hey, it's great that humans have rights here to say no to X, Y, and Z, but why doesn't the river have some kind of rights to also say no? Because when a frack wastewater uh, disposal project comes into your community, it doesn't just affect the people that live there. It affects the ecosystems and the natural environment upon which people depend. And so it didn't make sense to some people that the law would only be pushed 
to protect human rights to say no when there were other impacts to those ecosystems that were happening from those projects coming in. And from a Machiavellian sense, I think some people said, hey, it gives us a stronger hand to stop these projects from coming in. Because if it's not just the humans here that have rights that are being violated by this project coming in, and it's also we can build another rights basis uh, for uh, to stop these projects from coming in, then it makes us stronger to say no as a community to say just stop these things from happening. And so I think you got this weird mix of the Machiavellian people looking for the real uh, logical, practical, on-the-ground tools, and then you have another school of thought that says that, whereas in Western culture and Western civilization, going back thousands of years, uh, that nature has never had rights, that nature has always been treated as property, that in indigenous communities, nature has never been treated as property, that nature has always been something different, not something to be owned privately and used privately and consumed privately, but something that had a greater meaning or a greater capacity within the community than just property. And the white, you know, the Western lawyers back in the 1970s started this little fire around nature having rights and the concept of nature having rights. And then it kind of died out in the 70s. And we picked it back up again in 2008 with a little town, a little borough called Tamaqua in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, just north uh, west of Philadelphia that decided to try to stop. PCB laden dredge from the Delaware River being dumped in old mine pits in their community. And instead of just saying, hey, we as a community of humans have a right to say no to this project coming in, they recognized the rights of the river uh, that ran through the community, saying that if you bring that dredge into this community and it affects both us and the river, that we should have these uh, categories or pockets of rights that can be defended against that particular project coming in and causing those problems. And I think that resonated with enough folks that they looked at that and said, well, that's a whole new model of environmental protection. It's not a property-based model where we're trying to regulate people's use of property, but we're actually saying we need a rights-based model that says that ecosystems are capable of possessing rights and then the community is capable of standing in their in the shoes of the ecosystem to defend those rights. And whereas in 2008, I think it was kind of cr crazy. It was a radical idea that people scoffed at. You know, the first step is laughing at, at new things. And so I think it got a lot of laughter. Uh, it got less laughter after the Ecuadorian Constitutional Assembly, the National Constitutional Assembly writing a new constitution for the country of Ecuador brought us down to tell the stories about some of these communities that were adopting rights of nature laws and decided to incorporate those, the language and some of those stories into their own national constitution. And the people of Ecuador then ratified that national constitution, making it the first country in the world to adopt a rights-based environmental protection system rather than a property-slash-regulatory-based system of environmental protection. And from there, there were a couple of very high-profile enforcement cases in which ecosystems were bringing cases in their own names, like the Vilcabamba River in Ecuador becoming a plaintiff uh, against a local government that was polluting the river uh, and a judge issuing a decree that said that the river had rights and that the river's rights needed to be enforced and then issued other orders about how that would happen. And then it kind of boomeranged back to the U.S. Other communities started adopting these laws, like the city of Pittsburgh is the largest municipality in uh, the United States has adopted a right to nature law. And then to our amazement, uh, courts in other countries, even without uh, legislation started ruling on rights of nature for the Amazon and for the Ganges River and uh, other ecosystems they began recognizing as having rights. Uh, even though there were no, there was no legislative activity in those countries, they started borrowing these ideas from Ecuador and from other places and then began issuing these rulings on behalf of these ecosystems. And so as with before, people laughed about it and made fun of it and said, you know, this is about rights for rocks. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the journal Science just had an article uh, last week about the rights of nature. You know, a peer-reviewed scientific journal 
uh, with a uh, with an article on the rights of nature. And I think we've crossed some kind of Rubicon because uh, people are taking it more seriously. It's being talked about as a real alternative to doing environmental protection. And I think we're at a, a real uh, cutting edge point uh, between the, you know, let's make fun of it and time to take it seriously kind of thing. I remember back in the 90s when I was doing timber sale appeals, there was this one couple, I believe it was, who would file their own timber sale appeals. And a timber sale appeal is where the federal government puts out a timber sale on national forest land, and then the appeal is to show that they have failed, they, they, they have violated various regulations. Anyway, um, there was this one couple who, instead of signing their own names, would always pretend they would always put like badger or fox and then they would sign it with they would like do in ink they would do a little paw print <laughs> and I always and this I'm bringing this up because of the laughing thing that I always went back and forth back in the 90s thinking about okay so are they undercutting are the are the bureaucrats the forest service just going to laugh at them and throw it out because of that because they didn't quote sign it properly or are they actually moving moving uh moving the way people think about nature by forcing for at least a moment forcing those bureaucrats to think about the the animals who actually live in those those forests yeah, yeah, I don't know. I've seen, I think I've seen those same ones because you know, we used to have a photocopy of one of them that we kept here at the office. But I think people have long been longing for something like that, you know, understanding that there's a need for something larger like that and voicing it through various mechanisms that they had to do it. I think what's happening now is, is a little different because it's actually about harnessing the, the law, which for so long has been used in the name of you know, regulating the destruction of the environment uh, instead of being used for a different purpose. And the question that we always ask is, how bad does it have to get before people turn to force a different kind of environmental protection system? And I think that question was partially answered this uh, about a month ago, uh, end of February of this year, when uh, people of Toledo, Ohio, uh, fought for over two years to place a Lake Erie Bill of Rights onto their ballot uh, for the people of Toledo to vote on to decide whether to recognize that the Lake Erie ecosystem had certain rights. And, you know, they got taken off the ballot. There was a lawsuit that said you can't do this as the city of Toledo. People of Toledo organized, forced the city council to unanimously put it onto the ballot. Then they voted at the end of February of this year um, with uh, 60, 60 some percent of the vote to actually recognize Lake Erie as having the rights to exist and flourish and naturally evolve. And uh, and what that means uh, is that the lake, you know, has some attributes of a person in that the lake can can sue can sue those that are interfering with those rights. So Lake Erie today, as of the passage of that, uh, of that law, has the right to exist and flourish and naturally evolve. And that's in place now. And the agribusiness interest, because the biggest threat to Lake Erie, one of the biggest threats to Lake Erie's rights at this point is, are the algae blooms that are produced from the excessive amounts of fertilizer and manure put on land by mostly agribusiness corporate farmers who live in the Lake Erie watershed. And that's providing excess phosphorus into the Lake Erie, a watershed into Lake Erie itself, which is causing these algae blooms to occur each summer. And uh, last year and the year before, the algae blooms uh, caused half a million people in the Toledo area to lose their water supply. So half a million people couldn't drink the water from the lake, uh, had to boil it and treat it and do all those things. There were some advisories about even touching the water, that the water was toxic uh, because of the algae blooms. And so this question about how bad does stuff have to get, things got pretty bad in Toledo. Things got pretty bad around Lake Erie. And in response, the state apparatus, the only thing that they did was uh, ask for 
these agribusiness corporate facilities to voluntarily cut back on their phosphorus and fertilizer application, which of course didn't happen. And the algae bloom happened again last year, and they're predicting an even worse one this year. And so people people were done. They they've given up uh, hope that the state or federal environmental agencies are going to do anything other than kowtow to the corporate interests that drive the state of Ohio, corporate agribusiness specifically, and instead took it into their own hands to do something along these lines. And the power of these, you know, whereas 10 years ago, community could have, could have passed something that had been ignored, uh, the power of this stuff, I think, is shown by the fact that the agribusiness corporate uh, entity sued the city of Toledo within 24 hours after the passage of the law. So law passes, as soon as that uh, passage was known, then the next morning, the corporate agribusiness interest sued the city of Toledo to try to overturn the law. And so I think that shows the distance that we've come in some ways, that people are taking this seriously now. It is seen as a real-life uh, way to begin to transform environmental law away from this idiotic, insane regulatory system that we've been operating within for the last 20, 25 years and into something that's rights-based, that provides some of the highest constitutional-type protections to ecosystems. And I think that's that's what makes it exciting. So how how does the um, – how does Lake Erie, having been – Given rights, I don't know if given is the right word, but, but Lake Erie having rights, how does that mesh up with, I, I, how, what will be the primary strategy, legal strategy of the agribusiness? I presume, let's back up. I presume that the primary legal strategy of the agribusiness is going to be the, um, commerce clause. Am I wrong? And can you talk about what the commerce clause is? Yeah, primarily the agribusiness corporate strategy at this point in the lawsuit that they filed is that the municipality lacks the authority to adopt the law. So in the United States, we talked about communities not having the legal authority to veto certain projects coming into their communities. Um, part of the reason for that is this weird, this I call it weird, but it's been the law for a long time, called Dillon's Rule. It's a it's a rule that establishes the relationship between a municipality, so in this case the city of Toledo, and the state of Ohio and the federal government. What so it answers the question about what's the relationship between the city of Toledo and primarily the state of Ohio, and the answer is that the city of Toledo is a child and the state of Ohio is the parent. So it's known as Dillon's rule. It's been embraced by the and adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court. But basically, any municipality in the United States is a child. Uh, the state is the parent, which means that the state determines what powers the municipality can exercise and what powers it can't exercise. And so what the corporate agribusiness folks are arguing is that the city of Toledo was never given the power by the state of Ohio to uh, determine that lake, to, to, to recognize that Lake Erie has certain rights. That, in other words, its municipal authority is bounded uh, by the laws and regulations set by the state of Ohio and can't exceed those. And with the adoption of a Lake Erie Bill of Rights, that it exceeds those regulatory protections and other laws that are place, in place in, at the state of Ohio level. And so they're trying to close the portal of cities, towns, villages, and counties being able to adopt rights of nature laws by saying that it's an authority thing that you can't, that you're preempted uh, from doing this kind of lawmaking because the state has the power to control and regulate what happens to the lake. And so I think that's the primary, that's the primary shot because they don't have to deal with the rights of nature stuff at that point. They can just argue over authority, whether the city had the authority to pass it in the first place is the question that they want the courts to ask. The Commerce Clause is a strong second, although it wasn't raised in this particular lawsuit. It usually is across the board, which says that, you know, certain things are items of interstate commerce and interstate commerce is something that only the federal government can adopt laws on. And therefore, it's not within the authority of the locality to pass a law dealing with things that deal with interstate commerce. And 
in dealing with Lake Erie, it's not just interstate commerce, it's also international commerce. And so what you did see in the complaint that was filed by the agribusiness industry against the city of Toledo uh, is a, a citation to or an argument that the Lake Erie Bill of Rights can't possibly apply to Canadian activity that's violating the lake's rights uh, because that would violate this international commerce stuff. And the only people that can inter- that can control international commerce are the federal Congress. And so in one fell swoop, kind of this rights of nature stuff starts to challenge all of those things. It begins to challenge this conventional view of municipal authority as being constrained uh, and says it's not constrained. It's actually larger than that. And the municipality can override the state in certain circumstances. That's the argument about municipal authority being expanded. And then the second piece of that is, you know, whether it can override things like Commerce Clause protections or other pieces of those arguments Um, But again, I think it's very exciting because those questions rarely even get asked in our current environment because most of the traditional environmental lawyers will argue the regulatory details, but they never take on the power issues and they never take on the municipal authority issues. They just kind of sit back and say, "Okay, well, all these doctrines have been well decided and all we can do is is argue about how they can be applied, whereas I think. The rights of nature starts stuff starts to ask the basic questions about whether this framework should be the one that we use. And when a municipality, people of a, of a community act, whether they should have the superior authority to the state acting on behalf of the corporations, uh, who should be elevated among, among who or against who. And I think those are the kinds of questions that this, this work starts to ask. Well, that reminds me of two things. One is years ago, I I spoke at a sort of one of those big eco conference things, and it one of the things that absolutely drove me crazy was that I was the only person there who was talking about power relations, and I didn't understand how you can talk about social transformation without talking about power who holds it who who what institutions wield it what institutions don't have it and then a related story goes back i don't know if i ever told you the story you probably did back in the 90s i was uh at this i don't know what it was it was a a bunch of uh, people were brought together to washington dc to envision for a weekend <laughs> and the last one of the last envisioning exercises we did it was a bunch of uh, family farmers and environmentalists, uh, basically family farmers and environmentalists and community rights people some. Anyway, one of the last exercises we were supposed to do, this is probably 1997, um, was, was to close our eyes and pretend that it was 20 years hence and that we had achieved a sustainable community, which of course that was more than 20 years ago and we have obviously not achieved a sustainable community, which was one of my problems with the exercise in the first place. And the, the, the person said, I want you to see what it smells like and what does your community feel like and what is it, how do you walk down a path? You know, what, it, what is, what does the community feel like when it's sustainable? And then they went around the room describing it and I was just squirming in my seat and just very uncomfortable. And when they got to me, I said, look, we can envision a community that is sustainable all we want, but we all know that if we achieve some sort of sustainable community, whatever that means, and then those in power discover oil underneath the land, or they discover uranium, or they discover something that they want, they're going to take it. So it actually, if we don't talk about power, it doesn't really matter what we want, because it's all going to be taken anyway. So we have to bring power into this equation. So those are my two stories. You can do whatever you want with them. No, that's absolutely right. It's also why I stopped going to those kinds of events. <laughs> but as, and to traditional environmental uh, conferences as well. I find the, 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 the conversation among environmental lawyers, conventional environmental lawyers, is just so sad at this point because they just don't have anything to offer, and they suck these groups in. It's like it's like the environmental groups, and I think I've said this before, the major environmental organizations are almost as bad as the corporations coming in to take the oil or take whatever resource there is, because the communities are told to treat them as friends and allies. But 
the the major environmental groups come in and send them down this regulatory chute where all they can argue is about, you know, height of the fences around the frack wells or the color of the the drilling equipment that comes into the community or the hours in which the drillers can make noise. You know, my favorite are the laws that are allowed in Pennsylvania around sewage sludge spreading that can't be done on Christmas or Thanksgiving, but all other times are fine. It's like we've been relegated to these crumbs and the major environmental groups, they satisfy, they satisfy themselves with the crumbs. They say, well, this is all we have and this, that means this is all we can do. And they suck these groups down with them. And I, I, I've watched it hundreds of times and it's just disgusting. It's, 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 it's almost as if the environmental groups are as big a problem as the extraction resource corporations at this point in time because people put their fates into their hands and all they do is work within this system of law that's been written by the very corporations that ostensibly, <laughs> you know, the, the law is supposed to regulate because the corporations are writing the rules that define themselves. And then all we do is come in and attempt to enforce the laws that the corporations wrote to define their own behavior. So it makes no sense to me anymore. It, it, it did a very long time ago. But when you ask the environmental lawyers why they do what they do, they say, well, this is all we have. And if we don't do anything, the thing's going to go in and it's going to cause harm. Well, yeah, but maybe it's time to envision a whole new system and put our energies towards that. Because as long as we're spending 100 percent of our energy on the defensive end, trying to stop the harm from happening. And what we come out with is a better frack well or a better toxic waste incinerator or something that has its edges carved off slightly. We're still getting the incinerator or the frack well then maybe we should siphon off 5 or 10% of that energy someplace else to envision what a new system of environmental protection looks like in which we actually win. And our wins are not limited to those small parts per million or, you know, let's stop somebody from dumping on Thanksgiving kind of victories. And the more, the more I've thought about it over the years, the less and less effective I think any of these large environmental organizations are except in vacuuming up resources and money so that others can't actually envision a new system. And if there's any time to envision a new system, I think it's now. And I think in Toledo, even if the law falls, uh, which may eventually happen, you know, the, the corporate boys control the courts and they control the legislatures. And, you know, doing this kind of work in the face of that kind of overwhelming power uh, is tough. And kudos to the Toledo folks who had the heart and, and the, and the wherewithal and the courage to carry it through because it's going to take 300, 400, a thousand of those communities to put up their middle finger to the power system and say, this is the system of environmental protection that makes sense. And us fighting for these ecosystems makes sense. And we have to do it now because otherwise we're, we're out of time. We're not running out of time anymore. We're out of time. <laughs> And so, you know, these kinds of things have to happen more and more often. But it gives me strength to see, you know, Lake Erie, at least on paper, having having rights to be animated, not to be dead anymore to the law. Because just like slaves were in the 1840s and women were in the 1850s, that uh, they were invisible to the law. Today, ecosystems and nature, uh, they're invisible to the law. Yet we wonder why things keep getting worse from an environmental perspective. It's because these things, they don't exist. They're things. They're not rights bearing entities under the law. And I think the movement that's beginning to form is about shifting that so that our cities, towns, villages are actually rights bearing and have some, some authority to say no. But that also that ecosystems and natural systems have rights as well, that they're rights bearing and, it's no less a shift that happened with African Americans and women, uh, and labor, you know, the labor movement and the American Revolution, which was about shifting private corporations that were states into being something else. But I think that that shift is the basis for the modern movement that has to occur for us to really begin to recover from any of the effects of this culture and civilization that's been placed on us. Well, I don't know if this is a is an entirely fair comparison, but when you were talking earlier about the Commerce Clause, I was thinking about how that's why there were all those fights in Congress. And let me know if this is wrong. That's why there were all those fights in Congress uh, at the federal level as to whether new states that entered the Union 
would be free or slave because it ends up, and let me know if this is wrong, that the state itself then, because of the Commerce Clause, would not have had the right to determine for itself whether it was going to be slave or free. And that is why they would have to have the Missouri Compromise or whatever else. So the feds can say, okay, when, you know, Ohio or whatever state comes in, I'm choosing a state wrong, you know, whatever state was in the Missouri Compromise, Missouri, I guess, um, that the, the, those states will be declared at the federal level. And then the other thing that this illustrates is the whole horrific nature of still presuming of going under the old notion that African Americans were property to be dealt with under the Commerce Clause in the first place as opposed to slavery abolished. Yeah, and uh, it gets even it gets even worse or more pointed uh in when the uh, civil rights legislation was passed and then challenged. So, you know, the the time period in the 60s and 70s in which interstate transportation facilities uh like waiting areas and bus stations and all those types of things were becoming were forced to desegregate that uh the good folks on that side of the argument so the united states at that time backing the law because the law had been passed at the federal level uh, argued that african americans were actually items of commerce because they were trying to uphold the desegregation laws under the Commerce Clause as a uh, authority basis for Congress to have adopted the anti uh, the desegregation laws in the first place, and so you you see it most starkly in these oral arguments made in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, where one of the Supreme Court justices asked the United States, they said, "So you're arguing that African Americans are items of commerce, that they're crossing state lines, and therefore the laws are protected, they're supported by the Commerce Clause and the." You know, the Solicitor General said, yes, that's exactly what we're arguing, is that the Commerce Clause provides the basis for authority to pass this law. And the Commerce Clause has been used to uphold the 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 uh, Clean Water Act uh, in terms of those bodies of water that operate inter interstate to support a breeding uh, wildlife. So like ducks and uh, other wildfowl that travel from state to state to use interstate waterways to land. There's this great or argument that was held, uh, the case challenging the Clean Water Act and challenging congressional authority to actually adopt the law in which the United States that was defending the Clean Water Act said, uh, yes, we consider birds to be a part, uh, items of interstate commerce. And therefore, if they land on a waterway, that automatically protects the waterway under the Commerce Clause and therefore gives authority to Congress to have passed the Clean Water Act in the first place. And they came up with this rule, this legal rule called the reasonable bird rule, which said if a reasonable bird flying between states would land on this particular waterway, that it was then protected under the Commerce's, Commerce Clause's authorization of Congress to pass a law protecting that waterway. It's all so messed up. It's all based on property. It's all based on commerce. That's the entire constitutional system, which is why we've begun talking about the need for a new constitution, one that is based on the rights of people and rights of nature and something that fundamentally begins to remake the structure that we have because we don't think a tweak to it or an amendment to the constitutional structure that we have is going to make much of a difference, that it's really got to be remade because it was written back in the 1780s when property and exploitation of natural resources was the was the overriding objective and I think we're switching very slowly community by community in some ways to a different vision of what government should be. And I think a, a different constitution needs to be in that, in that offing because we need to change that basic structure over to something that works for us rather than something that is basically a suicide pact. So to be clear, you're, I mean, you're talking about rights of nature and you're talking about Lake Erie, but you're also talking about something much, much bigger having to do with the entire way that we uh, perceive the world. And um, I'm going to use a phrase I don't much like, but I'm going to do it on purpose, uh, the way we do business in the world. <laughs> so, it's, so is that correct? 
Yeah, the shorthand that we use is that the existing constitutional structure elevates property and commerce rights above the rights of people and nature. And we need something that does the opposite. It elevates the rights of people, communities, and nature above the rights of property and commerce. And, you know, that's the basic, I think that's the basic inversion that has to take place. And we're nowhere near doing that. Uh, right now we have pockets of resistance that, like, Toledo that have been doing this work and eventually those pockets have to merge and then become something much bigger, a movement much larger than we've ever seen, I think, in the United States. But our very survival depends on it. And it's not enough to talk about, you know, 350 parts per million or, you know, talk about climate change separate from that power relationship that exists because we're just nibbling at the edges and as long as we leave the thing intact in the middle, it's always going to undo what we attempt to do. And so at some point we have to begin to remake that basic structure of governance to reflect the kind of world that we need and that we want. And it's not there right now. One of the complaints I have about the mainstream environmental movement and especially the climate change movement is that they have converted the environmental movement from being about protecting wild places and wild beings into perpetuating capitalism, perpetuating this destructive way of being. And a great, one of the ways I say that is that these days you can have a hundred thousand people march on the streets of New York City or Paris or Washington DC. And if you ask them why they're marching, they'll say, we want to protect, we want to save the earth. And if you ask them for their specific demands, they'll say, uh, we want more subsidies for the solar and wind industries. Right. Which is an absolutely extraordinary thing to turn an entire social movement into a lobbying arm of a sector of industrial capitalism. Yeah. It's all, so, I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's also desperation. I mean, people don't know where to turn, and so they're being programmed by some of these larger, larger groups and larger organizations, I think, in some ways. Oh, I agree. So, so, if, if you could, if there were 100,000 people who were marching in the streets of Toledo, Ohio, or Washington, D.C., or wherever, and then they said, why are you marching? And they said, we want to protect the planet. And they said, what are your demands? What would you, what would you, if they were to ask you that, what would your demands be? Well, I think the demand is for a new governing structure, a new operating system that finally recognizes things that are important and that have values to us as being the most important values. So when rights of nature comes up against rights of corporations, you know, today under a conventional legal system, the rights of corporations win. And that's hardwired into the system. And so, so the system is very complex and it's very complicated and people don't understand even, they don't understand the system under which they're living. I mean, 99% of the people just don't have a clue how this system actually operates. They only, it only has relevancy to them to understand how it actually operates when they run up against it. And so if you got a 15,000 head of hog factory farm coming next to you, you have a reason to actually begin to question how the system operates. But most people have no reason to question and most people don't question. Most people don't understand how it works. So it's like these people repeating, make America great again you know, who have no clue what they're saying, but they've been programmed to say it. It's like, it's the same thing on, on our side of the fence, which is that these big groups get into a room and they say, okay, this is what we're going to work on for a year. And then they program that down through everybody so that they, they get echo from the base and from people who have no idea what they're saying sometimes that there's that programming that occurs. So, I mean, I think we need to clean house. We need to, we need to clean the whole thing out. We need to start from scratch and we need to figure out what operating system is going to work for our own survival on the planet. Uh, because right now the thing that we have guarantees the opposite direction that we're going to continue to destroy it. And it's all about power relationships. The U.S. Constitution establishes certain power relationships, whether that's between the the federal government and the state or between corporations that claim private rights within the constitution and communities that are trying to do, uh, to do otherwise or to do something different than what the corporation wants. It's just that nobody understands that. It's all camouflaged. 
And part of our job is pattern recognition to show people that it's not just them. It's happened a hundred other places. So when they're trying to ban GMOs, well, guess what? People in Hawaii tried to ban GMOs and they got overridden by the Commerce Clause and by preemption and by these other corporate legal doctrines. And guess what? The same thing happened in Virginia as people were fighting against this project and in New Mexico when they tried to ban hydrocarbons uh, from being withdrawn from the ground in the poorest county in the state of New Mexico. Or in, in Oregon, when they tried to stop aerial pesticide spraying, they get sued for the same reasons. Our job, in some ways, is, is very small. It's about pattern recognition to, to help people see that this is not just them getting the raw end of something, that it's happened over and over and over again. It's not the exception. It's the rule. It's the default. And helping them see the, the patterns, the rules that are in place as a means for them to say, well, something's really wrong here if these are if these are the rules or patterns that apply to these things. We need to get ourselves out from under them. So we have just a couple minutes left, and earlier you said that the recognition by Toledo of Lake Erie having rights, uh, you know, may not stand. And when you said that, that reminded me of a line I read in a thriller novel where they're going to burst into a building and one character says to another um, the first person through the door always gets shot <laughs> and I think about that with politics too That, and you said immediately afterwards that we need 300 other cities doing this that the way to do this is not for the rest of us to look at Toledo because the first one through the door gets shot the second one through the door gets shot The way what we need to do is to overwhelm them with as you said, 300 municipalities doing this, 400 municipalities, until until they start to get overwhelmed. So, A, you can respond to that. And, B, if somebody in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, in Biloxi, in Oklahoma City, Tulsa, wants to do something, what do they do? Well, they need to not wait for others to do anything. I think we have this thing where we self-censor and self-restrain ourselves to say our role is to try to convince somebody else to do something, whether that's a state regulator or our state representative or state senator or whatever. And we're saying it doesn't matter. You're not going to convince anybody. It just it doesn't work that way. Our Our whole organizing model the conventional organizing model is based on pressure politics, that we have to put enough pressure. If we get enough people and we get enough pressure, then we can change somebody's mind, and then that person is going to do X, Y, and Z. And I think that's nuts. I, I think that's what we've been relying on for change for the past 40 years, and it's crazy. We just have to do it ourselves. So they need to get in touch with us or get in touch with some of the other communities that have been doing this work, get in touch with the Toledo folks to talk about rights of nature, but actually start doing it there, which means taking it to their city council, taking it to their local elective body, running for office themselves so that they can become a standard bearer for these policies. But understanding that if change is going to happen, it's got to happen at home. It's not going to happen someplace else. This is not going to be a top-down thing where all of a sudden Congress passes a Green New Deal and everything's okay. It's going to be bottom up. It's got to be forced. This change has to be forced. It's not going to be top down. So this whole pressure politics thing is garbage. It does, it's not going to happen that way. So people shouldn't be putting their energy into it. People should be putting their energy into making, into becoming lawmakers. I think that's one of the only things that we really do uh, as an organization sometimes is that we say to people, you're the experts. You're not waiting for someone else to come in to save you. They're not going to come. You're the experts. You need to actually become the lawmakers, something that we've been stripped of and forgotten over these past decades, but that you're the people that you've been waiting for, not to be, you know, so, you know, the, the, the stupid sayings over and over, but you're the ones that you've been waiting for. You have to sit down and actually do it. You have to write a law, you know, do it, put your ideas on paper and then actually work to get it passed and challenge this power structure that's been put in place to guarantee that you will not be the lawmakers. I think that's that's what has to happen. The spirit of disobedience to existing conventional legal structures. Uh, we have to have a, a force of people, a, a, a significant number of people who decide not to accept no for an answer at those other layers of government and understand that change comes from below, not from the top. I think for the last 
many, many decades, the fundamental strategy of environmentalists has been to pray for a miracle. And I think the recognition that I hear you saying is that we need to recognize that the that the only miracle we're going to get is us. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Well, thank you so much for all of your great work, Thomas. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Thomas Lindsay. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio and the Progressive Radio Network.